From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Thank you, Ollie Barrett. Welcome to Thursday's programme, the longest day of the year. Good evening, Patricia Braunschweiler. How are you doing, Patricia? 21st of June, it is 2018. I'm Richie Allen. A glorious day again today here in the south of Manchester. What's going on? Good to be with you. Tweet at Richie Allen show between now and the end of the programme. If you've got something to tell me, I'll be only too glad to hear from you. So uh, let's do it then. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen show. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Right, I'm going to be rounding up the big news stories of the day in the course of the next hour. It's only an hour today. Don't moan, don't groan. Forgot all about a residence association barbecue that um, we're attending, the first of its kind, actually. And since I've been moaning and groaning about the lack of community spirit and people not talking to one another, um, I'll be attending that. So I'm with you till the top of the hour. It'll be an action-packed hour of news and analysis. I promise you that. Do stay with me and do keep me company. Tell me what you're thinking. As I've said already, it's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's how you reach the programme when it's live. At Richie Allen Show on Twitter. You can also follow what other people are telling me by going to Twitter, put search Twitter, put into search Twitter the words Richie Allen Show, all one word. Richie Allen Show, all one word. If you press enter, you'll actually see what other people are tweeting to me and you can engage those people in discussion as well. All right, I have a lot to talk to you about actually in this hour. As I said, don't moan, don't groan. One of those things, I I totally forgot about it. I'm terrible with things like that engagements and such like so with you for an hour today lots to get through though in that hour it's been a very interesting day indeed beware fake twitter accounts mr john nickel my friend and long time listener john beware fake twitter account that's john nichols by the way there's a tweet going around that that purports to be from the senegal football team having a go back at alan sugar or Lord Sugar, as he likes to be called these days. But it's a parody account. The Senegalese football team is a different Twitter account entirely. But it would have been funny if they tweeted that tweet to Sugar himself. All right. Now, this is... (laughs) Do you know, I wonder, is there any point in this when you believe, as I do, that we're not leaving the European Union? But I'm going to tell you anyway. Going to tell you anyway. European Union citizens will have to answer three simple questions online if they want to continue living in the UK after Brexit. Who said that? Well, it was Sajid Javid, the recently appointed Home Secretary. Sajid Javid said the government's default position would to be would would be to grant and not refuse settled status. So EU citizens will have to answer three simple questions online if they want to continue living in the UK after Brexit. I've seen the questions. The Richie Allen Show can report exclusively. We've beaten the BBC, Sky Channel 4, CNN. We have the three questions and they are. So if you're from a European Union country and you're living here, listen up. I'm going to give you advanced knowledge of the three questions. Question number one, what is the name of the local pub in Coronation Street, Weatherfield, Manchester? That's question number one. That will be on the online questionnaire. Question number two, who is the managing partner of Trotter's Independent Traders? And question number three, name the famous five characters from the Enid Blyton books. Easy peasy. Japanesey. Those are the three questions. Here's Sky News with more on this story. What you will need to do to remain in the UK 
after the UK leaves. Sky News. EU citizens arriving in the UK before the end of 2020 will be able to apply to settle in Britain after Brexit. The Home Office has been laying out more details of the rights of EU expats once Britain leaves the European Union. EU citizens will be able to apply for settled status if they can prove that they've lived in the UK for at least five years. People who arrive by the end of the transition period in December 2020 but do not have five years of residency will be able to apply to stay until they do. Applications will be made online will cost £65 per adult and £32.50 for children. Decisions on each application are expected to be made within two weeks. The EU citizens living in the UK, along with their family members, will be able to stay and continue their lives here, with the same access to work, study, benefits and public services that they enjoy now. Close family members living overseas will be able to join them here in future. EU citizens make a huge contribution to our economy and to our way of life. They are our friends, our family and our colleagues and we want them to stay. We love them. We love our EU citizen neighbours. We want them to stay. Remember the three questions. What's the name of the pub in Coronation Street? Who's the managing partner of Trotter's Independent Traders? And name the characters in the famous five books Enid Blyton wrote many years ago. All right. Those are not the questions. Here's the real questions. The real questions are... They're not even questions. All you'll have to do is prove your ID, number one, whether they have a criminal conviction, number two, and whether you live in the UK, number three. Those are the questions. Show me your ID. Have you any criminal convictions? And do you live in the UK? If you can answer those, you're in. <laughs> you're here to stay. What a load of balls. My questions were better. My questions were better. Coronation Street, um, the Rovers return... Derek Trotter heads up Trotter's Independent Traders and Julian Dickin and George and Timmy the dog time after time the famous five there you are those are the questions I, those would be the questions let me know what questions you'd ask be nice though be nice remember when um, Theresa May and her lackeys say that we are leaving the European Union in March next year they're not telling the truth it's lies damned lies and never ending lies because the borders will be open till at least new year's eve 2020 did i explain that did i explain that i didn't so i didn't i'm going to explain it in a minute the borders will be open till new year's eve 2020 anyway so what about the european union then what about reciprocating Sajid Javid, the Home Secretary, he's been pissing and moaning today and whinging that the UK has said, well, this is what we'll be doing, but nothing from the European Union about the rights of UK citizens currently residing in other European countries. What are the guarantees for UK citizens in Europe? Well, here's Sky News' Mark Stone. Well, it's all about re re reciprocity. So uh, there should be uh, exactly the same deal uh, for Brits who currently live uh, in the European Union uh, as, as, as was laid out um, by the British side for European citizens living in the UK. Uh, the numbers are, are large. We're, we're talking about three and a half million uh, Europeans who uh, have made the UK their home and well over a million, perhaps as many as two million uh, Brits uh, who live in continental uh, Europe. The, the number isn't, we're not sure of the number because many countries in Europe don't require uh, Brits to, to uh, sign in or register when they uh, so move to another, another, another country and age. Britain doesn't keep a record of who leaves. Yeah. So then the real number is not known. But but uh, I think for the sentiment from, from those Brits who do live in the European Union is that what the uh, Home Secretary has said today is a bit rich because uh, it's quite clear that neither side, neither the EU side nor the UK side, has given any reassurance at all uh, to either UK citizens living in, in continental Europe or EU citizens living in the UK. Uh, not least because of that phrase that we hear so often, um, uh, nothing's agreed till everything's agreed. Uh, and that sort of... Uh, uh, 
the fact that they don't really know what their status will be after Brexit uh, is very, very unsettling uh, for all those uh, people concerned. Yeah, that's fair enough too, by the way. I lived in Spain. The, um, the oft-mentioned Caroline and myself lived in Spain for a long time. And I know, and we know people living in Spain, they are concerned about it. And you suppose... I have to suppose and I have to understand that they would be, wouldn't they? Because of what he just said there, nothing is agreed till everything is agreed. So even what the European, even what the UK has proposed for European Union citizens is being taken by EU citizens here with a dose of salt today. Now, according to the Daily Mail this afternoon, this is it, you see. This is why we say walk away, rip up your membership of the European Union and leave immediately. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The Daily Mail is saying today that Brussels might force UK citizens to buy visas to travel in Europe after Brexit. This is not bullshit now. This is true. This is the sort of nonsense coming out of Brussels all the time. So that this doesn't concern EU citizens living in... This doesn't concern... See, it's very confusing. This doesn't concern UK citizens living in the EU. This concerns you and me unless you're living in America. But you and me, those of us who live in the UK, that if we want to travel in Europe in the future, we might have to pay for visas. And what this is about is draft plans were handed to MEPs today and they contained a proposal in a dossier of potential changes to EU laws which are being drawn up by the European Commission. Now this list was drawn up by Martin Selmayr, who's described by the Daily Mail as a very powerful aide to Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker. These plans emerged which um, involved paying £7 every time you visit a country, any country within the European Union, £7 for a visa, all this sort of stuff. This is what they're talking about. So just leave now. No deal, walk away. They'll beg for assurances for their citizens living in the UK because there are far more European Union citizens here than there are UK citizens in the European Union. Just leave and be done with it, right? So that's the big story today in the UK on the face of it. Let me just reiterate there. Let me just reiterate there what's going on. Um, Let me get these plans. Um, I've not got the details here now. But it's fairly straightforward what the, U- what, what the UK is offering European Union citizens anyway. If you've been here for more than five years, you're basically, uh, you, you'll basically get settled status. Let me reassure our listeners who are from Europe and they're living here in the UK. Right. If you've been here for more than five years, by the end of 2020, you'll get settled status if you answer the three simple questions. Meaning that you just carry on as normal. If you have arrived by December 31st, 2020, but you don't have five years residence, you can still seek to stay here. Right? And apply for settled status. And the scheme is also extended to economic area countries like Switzerland, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway. So that's the way it is. That's what the UK has put on the table. But the European Union is offering nothing, basically, in return thus far. That's why you walk away. Leave. Be gone. Now, I'm going to turn to a more serious issue, very serious stuff, this. The BBC, to its credit today, is running an exclusive story about the charity Medicine Sans Frontier. Forgive my ridiculously bad pronunciation. Medicine Sans Frontier. Doctors Without Borders, right? Allegations have been made that aid workers employed by MSF Doctors Without Borders have used local prostitutes while working in Africa and they've even bartered medicine for sex. A lot of that going around this year. Major charities finding that aid workers are spending money on prostitutes, including child prostitutes. No mention of child prostitutes in Médecins Sans Frontières but this is a deadly serious story. This is the BBC report on it this afternoon. 
Listen carefully to this. A BBC investigation has found allegations of sexual misconduct against one of the world's biggest foreign aid organisations. Former employees of Médecins Sans Frontières say they had seen women believed to be prostitutes being used by aid workers during missions in Kenya and two countries in Central Africa. MSF says it's deeply saddened by the allegations and will investigate. Anna Adams has this exclusive report. Medicine Sans Frontières is one of the biggest foreign aid agencies in the world. It brings vital medical supplies and clinicians to incredibly dangerous countries. But we've spoken to people who say some aid workers exploited vulnerable women. We have spent months talking to women who used to work at Medicine Sans Frontières and they've all told us very similar stories. We've heard accounts of endemic bullying, misogyny and sexism inside the organisation and in some cases even the use of prostitutes in the field. This investigation is not about the doctors or nurses. We're told it was some of the logistical staff who were abusing their power. A whistleblower from London told us what she saw when she was sent to Kenya. There was a senior member of staff who was bringing girls back to the MSF house. These girls were very young and they were rumoured to be prostitutes. It was difficult for people to challenge him because he was quite senior. We met another whistleblower who told us a senior member of staff had said it was possible to barter sex for medication. He said it's so easy to barter medication with these easy girls in Liberia. He was suggesting lots of the young girls who had lost their parents to the Ebola crisis that they would do anything sexual in exchange for medication. And had he been there himself? Yes, he had. In fact, he bragged about it quite a lot. To say it in front of three or four people who were there and to say it to me very directly, what's this all about? This is a huge story, this. Now, we know that Oxfam staff were at this in Haiti. And the more you see of this and the more you hear of it, you can't avoid concluding that predators, child abusers, those types of men who like to prey on vulnerable women, they see working for the big charities, maybe, as a way to target women and child prostitutes. It's a terrible thing to say, child prostitutes, isn't it? It almost implies that the child has made a conscious decision to prostitute herself or himself for money, when that's not the case. Child prostitutes are forced into prostitution. So you have predators going out to these places with the, under the banner of some of the most famous charities in the world, preying on women and children, trafficking women and children out of those countries. And I bet you, I bet you a thousand bucks to a dollar that if the BBC dug just a little bit deeper, they'd find evidence of organ trafficking in those countries as well, organ harvesting. I'm going to take a very quick break because I'm due a break. I want you to keep that in mind because when we come back from this break, I want to revisit an interview given by my friend Wayne Madsen to RT Television back in 2010 about charities doing this very thing. This is deadly serious. And when the media covers this, to be fair to the media, OK, they're covering it. But they're not even scratching the surface of what's going on. Very quick break. When we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's going on with these charities and maybe where some of this leads. Uh, this is Thursday's Richie Allen Show. It's exactly 21 minutes past the hour. Back with you with more on this story in two minutes. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Forever. 
Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. So before the break, I was talking about a huge story today, and that's not an exaggeration. Big story broken by the BBC. In fact, some of the producers of the Victoria Derbyshire show deserve a lot of credit for breaking it. And it's a story that there's multiple allegations being made and have been made for a number of of years now, it's only coming to light now, about aid workers who are employed by Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and how they've used prostitutes in Africa. And I mentioned just before the break, this year, of course, scandalous stories about Oxfam staff in Haiti and what they were doing as well. Now, I want to take you back a bit, take you back just a little bit to 2010. Now, you know Wayne Madsen from coming on this programme, very good journalist is Wayne, former intelligence uh, officer or intelligence employee, former Navy man, and he's been working with RT and a number of other, Press TV, of course, organisations for years. Now, back in 2010, Wayne was on RT talking about what was then a fairly explosive story. I know the adjectives are all very dramatic, but it was an explosive story. Now, you remember, after the earthquake hit Haiti in January 2010, you remember that 10 American missionaries from Idaho were arrested while trying to cross into the Dominican Republic. They had 33 Haitian children with them and most of those children were not orphans, number one. Number two, they had families and this was known to the Americans whom were arrested. Now, the group was known as the New Life Children's Refuge and that group had absolutely no permission to transport these children. They were arrested on kidnapping charges. Nine of them were released pretty quickly, but a woman called Laura Silsby was charged. She founded this New Life Children's Refuge. I know this is not new to some of you, but you've got to join up a few dots here and put a few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. This is very interesting now. Now, she went to trial in May of 2010, but when she went to trial, the charges had been actually reduced from kidnapping to a charge of arranging irregular travel. And the prosecution only wanted a six-month prison term. She was found guilty, but sentenced to time served, meaning she could walk away. Now, not long after, um, or, or, or... not long after she was found not guilty, I found, this is back in 2010, I was working in Spain at the time, I found a, an article by the Sunday Times which had been printed in in February, so even before she was um, found guilty and released, that reported that the Clinton family, and Bill Clinton particularly, had intervened on her behalf to strike a deal with the Haitian government. In fact, Clinton intervened on behalf of all the, let's call them the co- co-kidnapping, the, the kidnapping co-conspirators, the Clintons. And the Sunday Times said that her six-month sentence, which basically meant she didn't spend any time in jail because she was let out on time served, was considered at the time to be shockingly light. That's what the Sunday Times called it, to be fair to it. You know, I know it's a Murdoch paper. We know that Rupert is one of the devil's right-hand men. But it was good journalism. How did she get out? Shockingly light and, you know, six months. Terrible. My friend and colleague, Jean Ann Crowley, based in Dublin this week, has said, what an abuse of language to you to use terms like arranging irregular travel. They were kidnapping those children. Why? Were they kidnapping them? Now, speaking on RT back in 2010, 
Wayne Manson here talks about Haiti, but he gives a brilliant general overview of how predators are drawn like moths to a flame to disaster struck areas or crises in general. So they're talking about Haiti, but Wayne branches into talking about this in general. This is good stuff. Every time there's a disaster uh, of the magnitude as the earthquake in Haiti, we see uh, three types of individuals come in and prey on uh, children who have been displaced. Uh, it happened uh, in a tsunami uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, it happened in Chad uh, in 2007 where a French group called Zoe's Ark came in and took children who, whose parents were still alive. Ostensibly, they said they were Darfur uh, orphans. Uh, it happens every time. There's three different types of people that show up, unfortunately, on these scenes. There's the, uh, uh, the adoption mills, and that's what this group uh, seems to be involved with taking these children to the northern coast of the Dominican Republic, where there are plans by this uh, group that's based in Idaho to set up a, a huge complex, including a seaside villas for waiting parents who are waiting to adopt children to a restaurant. Uh, it doesn't sound like this is just a, a bunch of church people trying to adopt, uh, you know, uh, adopt kids. It, there's a, a lot of money behind it. Also, uh, pedophiles show up for child sex uh, uh, exploitation. And also we know from the Haitian prime minister that uh, he's charging that some of these children were being uh, 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 taken for organ harvesting. Well for organ harvesting, and yet they got away with it because the Clinton crime cartel headed up by Don Bill, Don William Clinton, basically intervened. Whatever promises were made, whatever threats were made, that these people got off with it. We talked a lot about this over the last few years, the sex abuse of children, trapping them out of these countries, these disaster areas, these zones, hit by natural disasters, sometimes by famine, sometimes by war, and maybe sometimes by natural disasters that are maybe not as natural as they seem. In go the predatory companies. Under umbrellas like the foundations set up by Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary. Harvesting organs. And I've no doubt that Oxfam aid workers, MSF, Doctors Without Borders aid workers, I have no doubt that some of them are involved in those activities. Trafficking children. Raping children. And harvesting organs. But I am prepared to accept. And I think you might be shaking your head here now, but I think you have to be prepared to accept as well that maybe the hierarchy of some of these organisations, these fat cats who get massive salaries to work as the CEO of some of these big charities, may not be aware of the scope of this. And when they hear that some of the aid workers have been bartering medicine to have sex with women, when they hear that some of the aid workers have been soliciting sex with children. Maybe it is new to these guys and these women who head up some of these charities. Maybe they don't know the full scope of it. Maybe that's how the cover works for a lot of these people. Because it's not just low-level scumbags, low-level child abusers that are working as aid workers in these places. It's more, I suppose, higher-ranked people that are in there. Their cover is that they're an aid worker for a major charity, but they're there to do the things that we just talked about. And neither the BBC nor any of the other news organisations in the world want to scratch the surface of it. Good that they're saying, right, we have evidence that some of these aid workers are doing this and they're doing that, but where's the follow-up? Where's the digging deeper down into what's really going on? Right? Huge this, absolutely huge. And it's left up to independent media people and independent researchers who don't have budgets, who really don't have budgets to be able to investigate this stuff and they don't have protection either. And I'm not going to list the names, there's no point because I'd be here all night, of the amount of people over the years that have died or have disappeared off the face of the planet. They've ended up in the Bermuda Triangle because they started following the yellow brick road down dark alleyways 
going after the Clintons and Epstein and others and they've simply disappeared off the face of the earth. That's the way it is. Going to move on. 27 and a half minutes to the top of the hour. Jean Anne is telling me that they don't seem to have much inclination to dig. She's talking about the BBC, of course, and the big powerhouse media organisations of the world. No, they don't, of course, because at the very top of these organisations are people intimately connected with some of those who have questions to answer about child trafficking. I'm not saying that the BBC's top brass or ITV News or Fox News, their top brass are involved in trafficking. I'm not saying that. But they have their own um, secrets. And many of the people who run the biggest media organisations in the world are heavily compromised. This is why they don't dig down in the way that we're suggesting they do. Now, here's a story that I covered today on RichieAllen.co.uk. And again, this is just explosive stuff. And I'm certainly not bigging myself up. Not at all. Don't take it like that. But my website is the only website in the world today covering this story. In the world. And that is that one of the biggest digital security firms in the world, namely, I would say the biggest, and that is uh, Gamalto, a company that's behind introducing biometric banking to the biggest banks in the world. Well, Gamalto, this digital security firm, is going to be taken over by one of the world's largest defence contractors, a company called Sales, an aerospace and defence giant based in France. And they're going to take over this digital security firm that is rolling out biometric banking. Now, they've bid for, Sales has bid for Gamalto. They've offered 4.8 billion euro. And the European Union has said they're going to scrutinise this deal, but they will announce whether the takeover has been approved or not by the middle of next month. It'll be approved. So this digital security firm, Gamalto, is behind this technology. Wait for it. Gamalto has major shareholders, including Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and BlackRock, the investment firm, Diddy and George Osborne. So what sort of stuff has Gamalto done? Well, it's rolled out smart cards as ID badges for companies like Pfizer. In fact, 100,000 Pfizer employees are wearing smart cards by way of ID badges, these smart cards made by Gamalto. The company has made e-driver licences, smart driver licences basically for Mexico and Sweden, and smart ID citizen cards for Portugal. They've got their fingers in all of the pies. Gamalto, which is going to be taken over by French aerospace and defence group Thales. So who are Thales then? T-H-A-L-E-S. Well, they're massive. 64,000 employees all over Europe, all over the world in fact, 56 countries. In 2016, their revenue was about 15 billion euro. They're the third large, excuse me, they are the 10th largest security contractor in the world, defence contractor. But they have an incredibly sinister past. Sales. They have been accused of running a major slush fund to bribe officials in countries around the world. They were once blacklisted by the World Bank, no less, because of their fraudulent business practices. This is all true. So you have a defence contractor, one of the biggest on the planet, with a history of fraud, is very soon going to own the biggest digital security firm on the planet, a firm that has developed biometric bank cards to prevent fraud. These are biometric cards, by the way. If you can imagine your debit card or your credit card, in the corner of the card will be a sensor for you to place your finger on. Your, your own debit card will read your fingerprint when you touch it to a machine. Nobody has any problem with a major defence contractor owning basically your biometric data and all of that information. Not to mention, as I said, that uh, the company, the digital security company, uh, Gamalto, 
is already involved in smart driver's licenses and smart digital ID cards and smart citizen cards for various countries around the world. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable that today in the United Kingdom, several tabloids wrote articles extolling the virtues of biometric banking. How wonderful it will be to place your fingerprint on your debit card and then you won't have to put your chip and pin in anymore. No need for contactless in the way that we do contactless now. Much more secure, anti-fraud. This is the way they sell it. When really, it's a scam to give your data, your fingerprints and everything else they can give about you. Right? To a major international defence contractor. Mad. But it's happening. The only article online about the consequences of this happening is on richieallen.co.uk today, which doesn't even have a millionth of the circulation of the Sun or the Mirror or, or the Daily Mail. Nobody's talking about it. Massive story. 22 minutes to the top of the air. Let's move on. Now, the United States House of Representatives is the lower chamber of the United States Congress. The Senate is the upper chamber. You probably know that. Last month, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the annual defence spending bill for the fiscal year 2019 and in doing so approved over $700 billion to be handed over to the Pentagon. This was rubber stamped by the U.S. Senate yesterday. It is utterly mad. Have a listen to Michael Maloof, former Pentagon official, in conversation with RT. As a consequence, uh, it's going to, it's, it's absolutely busted the budget. And we're talking 716 billion approaching a trillion. There was a sequestration on for a time, but that's now been eliminated. But you compare that 1716 trillion, uh, billion dollars to the Chinese uh, spending on, on defense of 175 billion, and Russia is only half of that. So the question is, What's the threat? What is the threat? Russia is spending about 85 billion. Just over 170 million the Chinese. 700 million dollars being spent by the United States. Wow. Now, Theresa May has been meeting with the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg today. It was a lovely game of yes, Jens. We'll commit to 2% of GDP spending on the military in the UK, even though We are in no danger of being attacked by another state either. Even though we have 4 million people needing to use a food bank to feed themselves and their children yens, we'll keep spending money on the military even though the country is in no danger of being attacked by another state. And of course, we'll blame the Ruskies for everything that's bad in the world. Here's Jens Stoltenberg, NATO Secretary General, and UK Prime Minister Theresa May. Allies have differences on issues like trade, climate change and the Iran nuclear deal. But we have had differences before. And the lesson of history is that we overcome these differences every time. We have continued to unite around our common goal to defend and protect each other. And that is exactly what NATO is doing today. This is the first time that the Secretary General and I have met since Russia's use of an illegal nerve agent in Salisbury. We saw a powerful demonstration of the value of the Alliance in its response to this incident, and I would like to thank the Secretary General for his and for NATO's support. This act was the latest Russian provocation in a wider pattern of malign behaviour, cyber disinformation, political subversion and increased military posturing. (laughs) <laughs> ah, the Russians. It's the old case of if you say things a thousand times or two thousand times, eventually, like a seed, it will burrow down into the subconscious of the populace and they will believe that the Russians are trying to subvert democracy and fixing elections and unsettling countries when the Russians are doing none of that at all. Right. <laughs> 18 minutes to the top of the air. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to lighten the mood for you. We're going to have a bit of classic virtue signalling from Owen, hysterical little bollocks Jones from The Guardian. Bit of virtue signalling when we come back. 
And it's all to do with Naz Shah, which might give you a clue as to what I'm talking about. This is Thursday's Richie Allen Show. Back with more after these. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Now, there have been calls for a reform of archaic commons rules after a sick Labour MP had to enter the lobbies in a wheelchair to cast her vote. Naz Shah said she felt she'd been stripped of her dignity after being told she would have to vote in person during yesterday's Brexit bill debate. So Labour, the Labour Party, has accused the Conservative Party, the government, of suspending a convention sparing unwell MPs from having to enter the chamber. But the government blamed Labour for her ordeal. Commons leader, Conservative Andrea Leadsom, said she was particularly sorry that Ms Shah, the Bradford West MP, had been forced to come and vote from hospital. But the fact that she had to come all the way from Bradford when she was clearly so unwell is clearly a matter for the Honourable Ladies' Party, said Andrea Leadsom. She said the government had only been told of Ms Shah's situation just after midday yesterday. So Naz Shah was very unwell. Apparently she was involved in a hit and run accident which uh, can't have been pleasant for her. She was hit by a car, apparently, and uh, was unwell and had to come in a wheelchair. Well, and, and, and I have sympathy for her. I'm not laughing at that. But it presented a huge opportunity for virtue signalling. And Owen Jones, the Guardian columnist and all-around hysterical little bollocks, was never going to miss a chance like that. But today he met a presenter on Sky News who couldn't stomach the sight or the sound of him. OK, Owen, Naz Shah had to come in in a wheelchair to vote. Start the virtue signalling in your own time. I think it was gross. I think it's pretty disgusting, actually. I mean, what seems to have happened is the government felt that, you know, they were almost trying to call the bluff of sick and pregnant MPs that they hoped they wouldn't turn up to vote against the government. And, you know, I think if you look at the moment, the Conservative Party, which a few years ago accepted, at least in rhetoric, that it had a severe branding problem uh, and had to detoxify itself. And we've got everything from a backbench Tory MP, Christopher Chope, who uh, stopped a ba- a, 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 the criminalisation of, of men taking photos of women's skirts. Yeah, we're and then we have talk the government. about that in a minute. Then, then we've got. Then we've got. 
then we then we've got the government dragging in sick and pregnant women MPs in the hope that they're so sick or they're so late stage in their pregnancies that they won't vote against the government. I mean, it's horrendous behaviour. What a genius Owen Jones is. He managed to bring upskirting, which is this sad and pathetic and criminal habit that men have, some men have, of putting their phones under women's skirts and taking a picture. He managed to bring that in to a question about Naz Shah coming from hospital to vote. What a little... Don't say it, Richie. What a muppet. Ms Shah's office said she'd been in hospital in Bradford since last Friday with nerve pain resulting from a hit-and-run collision. And it went against doctor's advice and she had to sign a form to be allowed to leave. I don't understand why she couldn't just fill out a form online to say this is the way I'm going to vote in the Brexit Bill Amendment vote. Simple as that. Then she wouldn't have had to leave the hospital. What's all that about? But anyway, virtue signalling a plenty. Owen Jones then took offence at the term Tory rebel. What an insufferable, pedantic, prole pretender this guy is. Um, oh, and Dominic Grieve, a very vocal rebel, we interviewed him many times here on Sky News, ended up voting against his own amendment. What do you make of his actions? Well, I'm not sure why you're calling him a vocal rebel. By definition, he isn't a rebel. He voted with the government. Well, he says including he is voting... himself. They're his words. Well, I, it's a, I mean, that's why the media has to stop using this term, Tory rebels. What happens is they well, tweet a lot. what should we call him and, then? And, Come on, tell us what we should uh, call him. A, a, a government loyalist. He just voted with the government. I mean, he's not a rebel. How can you be a conservative rebel if you vote with the government? That doesn't make any well, sense. Well, he tabled definition. an amendment of the House of Lords well, to get a meaningful vote. Did, he's did been a thorn he... in the side to Theresa May throughout the whole of the EU. With can, can I, can he's I, not a supporter, I, is he, particularly? Can I ask you a direct question? Did Dominic Grieve vote with the government or not? Well, you know the answer to that. You don't need to ask me well, that. Well, no, no, I'm asking you. Did he vote with the government or he not? He did. So then, he, is he a rebel? Yes or well, no? But the, well, don't I mean? I'm not the expert here. I'm interviewing you, Owen. Well, and I the know, point, but, no, but the not point is, he you, did. You, you, he did vote for the government, but he managed no, to get what he would say is a concession. And my question you, to you is, what do you make of his actions over the last you, two years? You, it's you not about whether we call him a rebel or not. Well, you're just wasting time now. I'm not. I'm not wasting time. I'm objecting to the way the media is trying to beef up conservative up, rebels, up. which do not exist. We've got to be well, accurate. They do exist we, because they have. I order you to be quiet. against the government, who are yeah, Tory about, MPs. Shut up, will you? About shut four up. MPs, four Tory MPs voted against the government. Dominic Grieve is not a Tory rebel. I don't know. Oh, right. Violence is wrong, children. Punching people in the face is wrong. Don't do it. <laughs> Even to Muppets like Owen Jones. She did well there, the presenter. What a pedantic little Muppet he is. To Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, you might have learned this afternoon that his wife has been charged with fraud relating to the alleged misuse of state funds. Her name is Sarah Netanyahu and she's charged with misusing 359,000 shekels <laughs> shekels which is about £77,000 why how did she misuse it well apparently on catering services at the Prime Minister's official residence what a cowardly scumbag Benjamin Netanyahu is he's trying to let his wife take the fall for his fraudulent corrupt behaviour no doubt about it right she's charged with a breach of trust following a police inquiry this is according to the Israeli Justice Ministry Mrs Netanyahu, Sarah, has denied any wrongdoing. The lawyers working for her described the indictment as absurd and delusional. Today she was charged along with Ezra Sidoff, a former Deputy Director General of Netanyahu's office. Netanyahu is hiding behind the sofa, letting his wife and his friends take all the hits. The Jerusalem District Attorney's Office said the decision to indict Mrs Netanyahu and Mr. Sidoff, or Sadoff, was made after reviewing all evidence and weighing the circumstances. Now, the details of the indictment are that Mrs. Netanyahu and Sadoff uh, are suspected of involvement in expenses claims made between September 2010 and March 2013 for food delivered to the Prime Minister's official residence and for hiring private chefs. These expense claims were said to have been made whilst covering up the fact 
that the residents also employ the cook, state funding for both is not allowed. The Attorney General's office stated last September, and I'll quote, in this way, hundreds of meals from restaurants and chefs were fraudulently received to the order of 359,000 shekels. What about arms? Arms for next leper? Shekels for next leper? Netanyahu reacted angrily. That's his only, that's his default position, Netanyahu. Angry. Uh, he has uh, long viewed as a witch hunt against his high profile family driven by political opponents. Of course, this is the least of his crimes, isn't it? I mean, it's bad enough that he's he's put his wife out front to take the heat off him. This is a scumbag beyond your imagination, really. Bad enough that they're, they're charging him with this. He's a demonic madman. His army kidnaps children in the middle of the night, locks them up with no legal representation, beats Palestinians, murders them, bulldozes their homes on a daily basis. But I suppose they got Al Capone for tax evasion, didn't they, in the end? I wonder what they'll get Netanyahu for. Seven minutes to the top of the hour. This is Thursday's Richie Allen Show. Shorter show today. Thanks for bearing with me. Packed a lot into this hour. And here's one for you. I think I might leave with this. This is utterly bizarre, right? Do you know, reading the newspapers of the world, not all of them, of course, but the big newspapers around the world, the big state newspapers in the United States, the big Nevada newspapers, the New York newspapers, Chicago, and so on, so on. It seems like every month, the Las Vegas police releases more body camera footage from the Mandalay Bay Bay Hotel shooting, which took place terribly on October 1st last year. Stephen Paddock is the man blamed for it. And we're told that he fired 1,100 rounds from a window on the... I can't remember which floor. Which floor was it, dear listener? Was it the 11th floor? Was it the 6th floor? Was it the 4th floor? I can't remember. Um, But he, he allegedly fired... 1,100 rounds, killing 58 people and wounding over 800. And they keep releasing this body cam footage of wounded police officers going about their duty like heroes. I have a question, and I guess you can bet what question is coming next. Why, nearly one year later, is there no picture of Stephen Paddock in the Mandalay Bay Hotel? Why is there no CCTV footage of Mr. Stephen Paddock walking around the Mandalay Bay Hotel, which must have 50 cameras per square foot? Where's the imagery of this man who killed 58 people, firing from the window of a hotel, wounding nearly 900 more, I think it was 850. Why have we not seen, I'm going to ask it again, some video footage of this man hanging around that hotel. Answers on a postcard, please. Thanks for listening to the programme today. I really appreciate it. I look forward to speaking to you on Sunday morning at 11am UK time. That's British summer time for Sunday View. I really look forward to that. Got some fabulous guests lined up for you next week, by the way, including the brilliant journalist Christine Hart, including the brilliant journalist Geoffrey Jackson, who's not been on this programme for far too long. Wonderful stuff lined up for you for next week. And a little bit of the esoteric next week as well, which I did promise you uh, a little bit earlier on this week as well. Thanks to Simon Stewart for looking after the YouTube. Thank you, Simon. Thanks to Jean Ann Crowley for her sage journalistic advice. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful weekend this weekend. Look after yourselves and one another. The weather's going to be fantastic here in the UK, so do get out and about. Stay off the cell phones. Stay off the smartphones, stay off the computers and get out and experience a bit of life. I'll talk to you on Sunday morning at 11. Until then, it's bye for me. Bye now. Bye.